First, I want to say I'm honored to be your guest. Thank you. It's a pleasure to return to my hometown. I flash back on old memories of singing with my thespian friends in the natural echo chamber with, that was the stairwell at KNA at Kenston and Allegheny, a different world now. Fast forward 30 years to April 1999 and I'm talking to a friend of mine who was a maintenance worker at Columbine High School. On April 21st, the day after the school massacre, I went very early in the morning to a local uh, department store. I bought, bought a newspaper to catch up on what happened the day before. A policeman was there, and for back in the 60s, being a young radical, I would not have done this. But the cop and I were hugging each other, and we really felt that open heart chakra, and we both pulled away and had wet eyes, and we both said, what's happening? The kids are killing kids. So that really triggered me to insert the threat of peacemaking into everything I live and do and teach. So I hope today to share some innovative, good ideas for not conflict resolution, but how to relax the tension in relationships. Sometimes we just don't know how to talk to each other, or we're unaware of our delivery. And I've always believed there's always a way to bridge any relationship, no matter how scary it might be to uh, confront hard feelings. A good quote from Sun Tzu is, in the midst of chaos, there's opportunity. So I encourage you, I know the natural response is to advert from conflict because it's laden with negative emotions, but I would like to encourage you to think of conflict more as an invitation to search for the truth. The first thing to do, I have a formula, the first thing to do is to do a cost-benefit analysis of the confrontation anticipated, just like any other project, and ask yourself, is it even worth the time and energy to deal with this person? You're not in your head. <laughs> we all have someone in mind, right? Is it even worth dealing with this person? Can I forgive and forget, or maybe if I can't forget, let go of it? And if not, the next thing to do is to decide, is this a person who just likes to fight? Or are these one of these guys who are out in the gravel parking lot behind the bar and want to fist fight because they love fighting? You know, there's a mentality out there people who just like to fight for the sake of fighting. And there's a reason for that. And I'll, I'll tell you what it is. There was a study done in 2006 of two different groups. They were politically right, politically left. It would have been cool if they put them in the same room together. <laughs> they asked them to define their position, why they're right. And when they did that, the frontal lobes lit up, right? Reasoning, logic. And then they were asked to define why the opposing party was wrong, and there was less thinking, less, less cognitive activity, but the emotional side of the brain, where disgust is registered, lit up. And so did the interferon dispensers. It's as if we got joy from being angry. So the neurophysiology of anger simulates similar brain chemistry for the feelings of power. Some people feel powerful if they're screaming, if they're aggressive, if they're pushing. So it's important to make this distinction from the beginning, whether this is someone who you can even approach. The first thing to do is delete them if you're, they're you know, the bully type, it's not gonna stop. But if anything from neutral onward, proceed. And the next step would be gather your best, closest friends as your support team to practice what-if scenarios. Because when we're attacked verbally or with attitude or inference, we naturally have a spontaneous reaction which we can change. I'll get to that in a bit as well. But our triggers can sometimes be self-defeating, our first reaction. I know I've said things in anger I wish I hadn't. So rehearsing that and practicing a calm mind. If you're a meditator, then you're already ahead of the game to keep calm, no matter what the other person does. And by rehearsing, your reflexes will bring back different types of responses. Because if someone is taking your peace. They're really holding your peace hostage. So it's important to think like a hostage negotiator and to talk like a hostage negotiator. To be sincere, number one. And two, to ask, what can I give this person? What do you need for peace? Do I owe you an apology? Do I owe you money? Do I, owe, do I need to return something I borrowed? What is it that can bring us to peace? 
Another important thread to put in, although it might not seem to have impact, particularly on a first meeting, is any common thread. You could say we're in the same family, if it's a sibling fight, or uh, we're in the same company, or we worked on this project, anything. It might not seem to have impact, but we're, like you said about the lockdown, we're dying for connection. And just that suggestion that, yeah, we're angry, but we're working together. Let's, let's fight the problem, not the person, as Gandhi said. And if you've ever studied martial arts, what's this mean? Does anyone know? This means stop, prevent violence. So by meditation, by focusing on how calm you're going to be, even if you're going into a legal situation, if you do this, if you calm yourself and know what your responses, your traditional spontaneous responses are, you've rehearsed alternative responses that your reflexes will kick in. I, trust me, I've done this and it works. You can disarm the tension in the relationship. Then, the most important thing is, I must warn you, this doesn't work 100%. You could lose, you could get beat up. So it's important to have your support team prepared to support you afterwards, either for a celebration, for the resolution, or some movement or adjustment in the relationship, or if you ended up taking it on the chin, uh, time to have some love and support. Talk about kindness. Adversity builds character. I remember practicing this back in 1972. I was working at Norristown State Hospital as a psychiatric aide. I was working with a progressive psychiatrist, Dr. John Bannister. We were all high on BF Skinner, behavior modification. So we did something very bold. We took all the adolescents uh, on the adolescent ward off the meds, very brave thing to do, in order to get a behavior baseline was quite wild for six months. The program was cut short because it resulted in $3,000 worth of indestructible furniture damage. But it was a good way to start <coughs> applying medications in different levels because as you might know with psychotropic and antipsychotic meds it may take up to three weeks for the whole system to get in place. Well I was rewarding the kids, the disturbed adolescents, which was really disturbed family systems, I was planning to do some good things for them. I taught them how to cook. I uh, did silk screen. I taught them silk screen screening. We had a lot of fun. And then we did the brave thing. I said, let's go off campus. That was like, wow, the biggest thing in the world for the kids. So I was allowed to take them down to the main entrance. Across the street, there was a bar restaurant. We went in and had Cokes and cheeseburgers and came back. And as we came through the entrance of the facility, some neighborhood kids, a gang of kids, came up to us and started calling our kids crazy kids, and they wanted to respond and fight, and there were only two or three of us aides there trying to restrain the most muscular ones. And me being the leader, I stepped forward, and this skinny young kid comes up to me with a, a knife, and he pokes the point right in my belly, and he, he says, you're gonna die. And I swear, I had rehearsed what I'm teaching you, and what came out of my mouth surprised me. I calmly said, you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison. And the boy closed the knife, cursing me as they went away, and I thought, well, it really does pay to rehearse when you know you have a tense relationship. I also want to tell you about what the major triggers are based on the work of Dr. William Moulton Marston. Are any of you familiar with the DISC theory? Good. It's a theory of personality. It's 2,400 years yeah. old. Yeah. You're familiar? With DISC, yeah. DISC. It was developed, the uh, early thinkers, Greek, three Greek thinkers and one Italian physician, had a sense of basic elements, uh, they, the atomic level, so to speak. So individually, they thought we were made up essentially of the base materials, earth, wind, fire, or water. So if someone was too much of a hothead, it was said that he had too much fire in his blood, so they would bleed them to drain the fire. And the same thing if someone was too wishy-washy. They were said they had too much water in their fluid system, so they would bleed them. No wonder so many people died in the early <laughs> days of medicine. Dr. Marston developed this theory, expanded it in the late 40s. He was very experimental, and he developed you're familiar with the profile. It's actually a disc. Imagine a circumflex, a disc with an x-axis and a y-axis. 
And along the x-axis, he asks, is the world a safe and friendly place? Well, if you think it is, absolutely, then you land over at 3 o'clock. But if you think you should be cautious and it's hard to trust people, and the world's scary and there's always trouble around the corner, then you're probably at 9 o'clock. If you feel you have strong self-efficacy, self-confidence, you have power over what comes at you, then you're at 12 o'clock. If you're the opposite, if you respond <coughs> to the environment, then you're at 6 o'clock. Well, each of these four dimensions, and we all have a mixture of them that change constantly. We're not fixed. I don't want to label anyone. I do not like that because we have all those characteristics. But the major fear of the high dominant, the high assertive, aggressive person is the fear of being taken advantage of. So if you're in conflict with someone, if you can not directly say this, but infer that you're trying to be helpful to them, that you're not taking advantage of them, that will take you down a few notches on the tension scale. If it's someone that's in the, what we call the I or the empathy factor, the way they go crazy when they assault you is with emotional abuse and maybe even slander. So what you want to do is make them feel comfortable that the relationship is not going to be destroyed because you have a problem to solve. If you're one of those people, I, I don't want to label again, but it's a style and not a person. <laughs> If you have a tendency towards steadiness, security, loyalty, that person really fears loss of stability in the environment. You might approach that person, depending on who they are, by saying, hey, if we can work this out, you know, going forward, things will go much more smoothly. And then the person that falls, the style that falls into the sea or compliance side, they are very quiet. It's sometimes hard to uh, know when they're angry because they don't like to share their thoughts and feelings with people. They're, they're the private, very super private people, and we need them. They're the bean counters, they're the observers, they're highly intuitive. But if you're to the point, direct and gentle in your delivery, that'll help reduce the relationship tension in that relationship. So these are four different aspects of personality to consider. I'll, later I'll provide you with some reference materials as well. I just want to close by saying that it's been a pleasure to have a receptive audience that I think is going to apply some of these principles. I've left some, left some research materials for you here. And I'll close by another quote from Sun Tzu, and that is, it's more important to outthink your enemy than to outfight them. Thank you very much.